five campuses, four congregations, multiple worship services and locations all across Middle Tennessee. It's amazing what God is doing. And it's important that we find time to get together, all together, to celebrate and to meet the people He's using in our own church to do His work. So let's do that. On Sunday, October 19th, let's come together on the Brentwood campus for an afternoon of fun and fellowship. We'll have games and food, lots of food, and plenty of new faces to meet. So grab the lawn chairs and blankets and make your plans to join us on the Brentwood campus starting in Hudson Hall at 3 p.m. and then moving outside for the Celebration Festival 2014. All campuses, all congregations, all together. As we expand our outreach through the Middle Tennessee Initiative in the areas of poverty, education, health care, and evangelism, it's important that we recognize how to love people well in a way that restores dignity for those truly in need. Andy Jones with the Chalmers Center will be with us Sunday, October 5th in Hudson Hall on the Brentwood campus at 5 p.m. to share what poverty truly is and how we can step into the story in healthy and helpful ways. There's no cost or registration for the event. Simply join us Sunday, October 5th at 5 p.m. in Hudson Hall on the Brentwood campus. Students, it's time for the fall retreat. Sign up today for the annual all-campus retreat, November 21st through the 23rd at Jonathan Creek in Hardin, Kentucky. That's three days of worship, fellowship, and small groups. This year, we'll focus on Acts 17 and the uncommon stand, truth, life, and choice we are each called to make. Be uncommon in your school and community every day. You won't want to miss this weekend. And 6th graders, it's also time for the 6th grade escape, November 21st and 22nd, a weekend designed just for you. Register for fall retreat or 6th grade escape now on your campus website. Check your bulletin for details. Hi, I'm Julia Kasich, the student ministry assistant, where I have the privilege of helping the ministers in planning events and serving students as well as their families. Welcome to worship. If you're a first-time guest, we would love for you to register your visit with us by completing a communication card. These are in the pew racks in front of you, or in the bulletin if you're worshiping in Hudson Hall. And remember, anyone can use this card to update contact information or to submit a prayer request so we can be praying for you. Just drop the card in the offering a little later in the service. Now let's begin our worship together.
Thank you, boys and girls, for your leadership. And thank you, Teresa Harlan, and your team for your leadership of these boys and girls. Thank you so much for leading us in worship this morning. As we continue to worship, would you all stand, please, and find two or three people around you. Shake their hand and tell them I'm really glad you're here.
scripture in 1 Corinthians says this, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that as it is written, that the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Sing together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What eyes of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving seems, my comforter.
together. Holy King Almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore, I join with them and bow before Jesus. sing about Jesus and outside this place we live for Jesus the truth that we sing in this place transfers and translates to the truth we live outside the walls we're grateful that we get the chance to do that we can freely come to this place and sing about who Jesus is because over and over again he's proven to us that he's faithful he forgives he saves he heals all of that and so much more So as we reflect on that in these moments of prayer and altar time, we'll open up this place down here at the front. You can come and kneel if you'd like to. It's an outward expression that communicates to Jesus his worth and his value. Maybe you stay where you are and pray. That's fine. Our pastor will be kneeling here at the front. And as you might want to come and pray for him, we call to your attention that this week or in the next couple of weeks, we will have two teams, short-term mission teams, leaving from Brentwood Baptist Church to travel to Israel and to Haiti and to minister there. So what a great opportunity to pray and lift these people up in this moment as well. However you need to use this time, make sure, make sure that you communicate in your own way to this Jesus and all that he has done for us. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for your word that reminds us that I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens, and your faithfulness reaches to the skies. So be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. Father, I pray that in this place, you would be exalted, O God. Your glory would be over all the earth and it would begin in this room with these people. We thank you for the privilege we have, Lord, to make much of you. We thank you for our children who began this morning showing us how to bless you. Thank you for the truths that they are learning, Lord. We thank you for how that inspires all of us to want to bless you, to proclaim that in Christ alone our hope is found. Father, we pray for these teams that will be leaving in the next day.
day or week. Team members, Lord, going to Haiti and to Israel. Father, I pray that they would exalt you above the heavens and that your glory would be all over all the earth in Israel and in Haiti. Use these people to minister, Lord, in your name. And Father, we pray for our pastor as he comes in just a few moments. May your spirit be upon him to proclaim truth, Lord, to us. And may we listen. May we hear. May we obey. We thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. And we ask all these things in your wonderful name. Amen. I hope you saw in the announcements the opportunity that we have this afternoon at 5 o'clock uh, to spend some time with Andy Jones of the Chalmers Institute. Uh, the Chalmers Institute is one of the leading think tanks uh, in the United States about how to best respond to the, to the uh, needs of poverty uh, in, in our country. Uh, they are located at Covenant College in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we have had them up to talk with the staff, and it's one of the most impressive things that we have done as a staff together. Uh, and we have an opportunity to help you understand that today at 5 o'clock in Hudson Hall. I, I, trust me, it will be well worth your time to hear what Andy says about poverty and how the church can best respond to it. Now, before you go on your way out, uh, you will see a group of senior adults handing out Christmas stockings. Uh, it is part of their mission trip to uh, support the uh, crisis center. Uh, in the Copper River Basin area uh, of the state of Tennessee is in the extreme southeast corner of our state uh, in Polk County, one of the poorest counties in all of America. Most of the families there live un, uh, with uh, uh, annual income of $7,000 or less. Uh, we have been involved with this crisis center for some time now. We have sent our medical uh, mission and dental van over there and... Uh, Several mission trips from Kairos and other groups have gone over there to work uh, because this crisis center responds to housing needs, medical needs, uh, clothing needs, food needs, uh, everything. And one of the things that we have found out <clears throat> is that most of the kids in this area simply won't have Christmas. And so we have been doing this for the last several years. We want to give you a chance to be involved in it this year. So on your way out, grab your Christmas stocking. The senior adults will help you talk about what you want to put in it and then bring it back at the appropriate time, we'll make sure it gets to those children. Uh, over and over again, the Lord opens up doors for us to be involved with. He uh, gives us opportunities and ministry uh, moments. And when the reason we're able to respond is because of your generosity, because uh, we worship by bringing to God his tithes, we celebrate his goodness by bringing his offerings. And because of that, we have the resources that we need day in and day out to respond to those chances that the Lord gives to us, to those moments he opens for us. So if you're joining us in Hudson Hall, you'll find the buckets on the tables in front of you. If you're in the bleachers there, they'll be at the end of the row, and you'll help us by getting that started. Of course, here in the main sanctuary, the ushers will be coming forward. So we pray you will join us now as we continue to worship together. Let's pray. Receive our gifts. Because we are grateful for all that you have done for us. Mindful of how you have answered our prayers. Even in those moments when we didn't realize what we were praying. So we pray that you will use these resources to meet the needs of others. So they too will understand your love for them. And respond to the call of our Savior Jesus Christ. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Church family, joining me on stage are three of our best. Matt and Jamie Hoppy and Kyla Conley. These are your missionaries that are home for a rest, here to regroup. Think about it. The cities of London and Los Angeles, two of the most influential cities for good or bad in and on our planet. And we have the privilege of placing the Hoppies in London and Kyla in Los Angeles. And as the offering is being taken, we wanted you to see living examples of your generosity at work. Uh, Matt and Jamie and their son Jackson. Matt came to Brentwood Baptist when he was one or two years old, grew up here in the church, uh, serving in London. Matt and Jamie, welcome. And 
tell us a little bit about what you all do in London. Uh, so we live uh, on the west side of London, and uh, we run a basketball club. Uh, we use basketball to uh, build relationships uh, and, to, and go into the dark. Uh, London is very dark. There are no, uh, not a lot of believers, not a lot of followers of Jesus. So we use basketball to build relationships and to share the gospel with people, um, whether it's in our home, on the basketball floor, in coffee shops, pubs. We, we use those relationships um, uh, to shine light into a dark place. And let me say that the hoppies are appropriately relentless in that task. You guys do it so well, but it's hard, isn't it? Jamie, how do we pray for you guys? Yes, um, it's like Matt said, it's a very dark place. And people there, they have all their physical needs met. It's not a third world country. And so sharing Jesus with them, they don't see their need. And so we ask that you pray that their, their hearts would be softened to the gospel and that they would receive what our Savior and King can do for them. Amen. Kyla, uh, been a part of our church for a long time. She was one of the team that helped start Kairos years ago and has been in L.A. for the last four and a half years. Kyla, paint a picture for us of your life and work there. <laughs> um, so I moved to Los Angeles four and a half years ago and um, thought I'd be working with homeless people and got there and was faced with the issue of human trafficking. And I now am the director of um, the largest residential recovery program for traffic victims here in the U.S. Um, we have a 20-bed safe house. And then two years ago, we were able to open what was my dream, and that was to have an emergency shelter specific to traffic victims. And so um, we have an outreach team that goes out, and um, we connect with girls that are being trafficked on the streets. And then, um, yeah, we work with law enforcement, FBI, Homeland Security, and we just had our 140th rescue through our emergency shelter since it opened a year and a half ago. Amen. Amen. Isn't that great? How do we pray for you? Um, I always tell people there's nothing you can pray that I don't need. So if you can pray a prayer, I need it. Um, <laughs> You'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. Anything, anything you want to pray. Um, but yeah, I think rest. And then, you know, the scripture talks about a patient endurance. And I run at a very fast pace and I get very little sleep and um, because we're on 24-7. And so um, rest and endurance. They've been sent and our job is to send. Thank you, church. Would you join me as we lift them up in prayer? Dear and gracious Heavenly Father, I pray for the Hoppies. I pray for Kyla. Give them the rest they need. Give them the endurance, the perseverance. For the Hoppies, as they sow seeds on hard soil, may they find encouragement in you. For Kyla, as she is confronted daily with the depths of depravity, may she always see your face as the only hope. We love these. May they go now with our love. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Oh, you messed up now, aren't you? You just saw that stewardship word up there. And you didn't realize that was the subject of the sermon. And, and now, you know, you're stuck and you're here and Unless I pray real long in a minute, you're going to have to sit through this whole thing. Uh, I don't know how we let the word get so small to where you only think it involves your money. It involves all of you, every aspect of your life. And growing in stewardship is a necessary rite of passage for a Christ follower. Uh, we have those moments in our lives, those moments where our family symbolically recognizes that things are different now for you. Uh, the first time they let you stay at home all by yourself. <gasps> when they give you the car keys. These things tell us that the family now recognizes that you have grown, you are different, you are now capable of, of, of different things, and you are now ready to handle a different kind of responsibility. In the life of faith, as in our everyday life, there are those same moments, those rites of passage, where the Lord says to you, you have grown up. You are now ready for different responsibilities, a different level of expectation. And so he invites you to be part of his work in different ways. The hard thing about growing as a Christian is that Jesus trusts you with more and more, invites you to more and more, and that more and more gets harder and harder. So Paul reminds the Corinthians. And so the Corinthians remind us. 
Stand with me now in honor of God's word as we read this familiar passage in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God granted to the churches of Macedonia during a severe testing by affliction. Their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed into the wealth of their generosity. Well, I testify that on their own, on their own accord, according to their ability, beyond their ability, they begged us insistently for the privilege of sharing in the ministry to the saints. Not just as we had hoped. Instead, they gave of themselves, especially to the Lord, then to us by God's will. So we urge Titus that just as he had begun, so he should also complete this grace in you. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, excel also in this grace. I'm not saying this as command. Rather, by means of diligence for others, I'm testing the genuineness of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, although he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Teach us this grace that we may be a generous people as you, O Father, are a generous God. That we may live with a reckless abandon that you lived with. And when the time came for you, you didn't hold back in your giving. We pray, Father, that in that moment when you ask us, we won't hold back either. And we pray this in your name. Amen. <laughs> it's kind of strange that, that Paul is appealing to the Corinthians for unity. The Corinthians couldn't agree on anything. Uh, they couldn't even agree uh, uh, with themselves. They had those among the church in, in Corinth who believed that they were so spiritual that they could do anything in their body... And their spirit was so strong that whatever their body did, it didn't affect their spirit. They couldn't even agree that they were one person, uh, uh, one self. They couldn't agree that Paul was a true apostle. And a lot of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians is, is justifying his ministry, explaining his call, and telling the Corinthians why he had the apostolic authority over them. They needed to listen to him. They didn't agree on uh, how to handle a worship service. In those days, a worship service was every night, and it usually started with a fellowship meal. And so if you didn't have, if you were wealthy enough that you didn't have to work or work regular hours, you showed up to the worship service early. And then those who showed up to the worship service early ate all the food. And the working people, by the time they got there, there was nothing to eat. They couldn't agree on anything. And now Paul is saying, I want you to do this as a mark of unity. It's a little ironic that Paul is appealing to the Corinthians for unity. This was the most ununified place that Paul dealt with. But he's appealing to them on a couple, for a couple of reasons. One, God was up to something in the Roman Empire. And, 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 and this was given Paul a particular moment to testify what God was up to. Uh, in Jerusalem and in the surrounding area, there had been a drought. And this drought had been going on several years. And it had been several years since they had had a healthy harvest. Because there had not been a healthy harvest, there wasn't enough food. And in that moment, people were beginning to suffer. And in their suffering, uh, the Romans took care of the Romans. The Jewish people took care of the Jewish people, but because there was a small little band called Christians that neither uh, adhered to the Roman nor to uh, the Jewish loyalties, then they were abandoned. Nobody took care of them. So Paul saw this as an opportunity for the Gentile Christians to take up an offering to provide for the need of the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. By receiving this gift from the Gentile Christians, the Jewish Christians would recognize the Gentile Christians as 
brothers and sisters in Christ. By giving the gift, the Gentile Christians would recognize the Jewish brothers and sisters as brothers and sisters in Christ who had a need. And if a brother and sister in Christ has has a need, we're obligated as brothers and sisters in Christ to meet that need. So they did. It was also a way to tell the Roman government that there's a movement going on of unifying people across ethnic lines, across language barriers, across geographical barriers that was growing in spite of the empire. There was indeed a new king and people were coming into this kingdom and the Roman government couldn't do anything about it. The emperor nor the empire could stop it. You may execute the leaders, you may imprison the believers, but now the harsher the treatment the faster the church would would grow. And this was a way of letting everybody know that if you are a brother and sister in Christ, you have brothers and sisters anywhere you are in the empire. Do you know where the, the steeple comes from? Have you ever wondered why it's such a big deal? Because in the early cities where Christians would gather, they would stick a pole up over the place where they met for worship. And it's on this pole most of the time would be a cross. Because when you came into a city as a traveler, if you were there on business, you were looking for people, friends you could stay with, friends uh, that, that, that would protect you in the city. And so Christians would learn to look for that pole with the cross on it and they would know, I can find brothers and sisters here. Brothers and sisters who will take care of me. Brothers and sisters who will be my friends. I will find somebody that I will have something in common with. And Paul makes his point. What is it that we have in common with each other? We're all sinners saved by grace. The common bond that holds us all is we were once lost, now we're found. Now the details of these stories may change from person to person. The uniqueness of the experience may be different from person to person, but that is the glory of our God. That is the greatness of our God that he condones, he condescends to meet with us in ways that we can understand. Your salvation experience is going to be different than my salvation experience. Why? Because you're different than me. You would need to be reached. You would need to be brought home in a different way than I would. How good of our God to find a different way for all of us. Now, just because you have a different way doesn't mean, one, you have the only way, or two, you have the best way. Sometimes we will have an experience that is so significant, we will think it's the only way, and we will begin to judge other people by our own experience. How Jesus deals with you is not necessarily how he would deal with a brother or sister. But we have all of this in common. The bottom line is we're all sinners saved by grace. That's the one thing that binds us together, that pushes past all the things that will separate us. This is the thing that binds us together. And Paul recognized that, so he called on the Corinthians to reach out to their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And he did it by mentioning a couple of things to them. One, giving is something that Christians do. Because we have a generous God, because generosity is the mark of our God, because the incarnation itself and our salvation story is a mark of unbelievable generosity, we as his people are a generous people. Now, Paul may not have told the Corinthians what to do. He didn't mind tell them what the Philippians did. A little friendly competition didn't seem to bother Paul at all. You are rich in every way, he reminds them. Now look at what this poor church in Philippi did. If they did this, then how much more are you going to be able to give? Christians are generous. Christians give. Why is that? One, we learn to separate wants from needs. Now we live in a culture that generates all this information about all the things that you must need. And it gets real confusing because most of the things that they sell us are wants. Okay, our needs are very few. We have lots and lots of wants, but very few actual needs. Let me give you an example. This past week, I'm reading my email. And an email flashes up from my phone company. And it says, congratulations, Mr. Glenn. You are now qualified to upgrade early. (laughs) 
Not five seconds before, this phone was fine. Now I read this email and my phone's not fine. I need to upgrade. I mean, really, can I, as a senior pastor of Brentwood Baptist Church, actually stand up here and say, I have an iPhone 5. I'm sorry. Doesn't a man in my position need to upgrade? No, I don't. This phone is fine. Does everything I need it to do and a bunch of stuff I don't want it to do. Once more, press me even harder and I'd have to confess, I really don't need a cell phone at all. (gasps) Mike, how do we ever live without cell phones? Very well. We lived very well without cell phones at all. See what happens? You need this. No, you don't. You begin to separate your wants from your needs. Then you increase the capacity to be generous. The second thing we learn is there's nothing on the outside that gives us value to who we are. Your value as a human being is established in two eternal facts. One, you are created in the image of God. You bear the imago dei. Jesus reminded Peter, what I have created, don't you dare call unclean. What I have made, don't you dare judge. You bear the image of God. There's something about you that makes us know the person of God in a unique way that only you bring that makes you valuable. The second thing we know is that Jesus Christ died for you. My friends in real estate tell me that something is only worth what someone is willing to pay for. it. On the day that the world demanded your ransom, Our Savior laid down his life for you. That's how much you're worth. And nothing on the outside of you can trump the reality that Jesus died for you. Nothing is more important than that's how much you're worth. And so the world tells you, you need to have this kind of car. When you pull up, you want people to see the statement that you're the man. The clothes you wear, they have to make a statement. Really? Once you say Jesus Christ died for me, what else needs to be said? That statement, enough. He reminds the Corinthians that giving is a grace that you learn and grow in. Most of us make the mistake of thinking that we're somehow born again, full grown. You're not. You have to learn. And you learn by starting where you are. Start where you are. You know where I started? I started with the very first allowance that I got. Now, my mom and dad gave me 25 cents a week as my allowance. Now, before you snicker, I'm old enough to tell you 25 cents in those days was real money. My mom and dad asked that I give a dime of that as a tithe. Now, I wasn't the sharpest kid in school, but I could do that kind of math. I recognize that a dime is a lot more than a tithe. A tithe of a quarter is 2.5 cents. And all of my generosity, I was willing to give an even three cents. The other 22 was mine. So my dad said, you don't think you should give a dime? No, sir. Okay. Why don't you go think about what Jesus has done for you and then come back and tell me how much you should give. And we'll go with that. I did. I came back and I said, I've been thinking, Dad. He said, well... I said, I really should give it all, shouldn't I? He said, yeah. 
But I don't think Jesus will mind if you keep 15 cents. You really should give it all. Because the standard of giving is not 10%. It's funny to me that some people I know in church who cannot find the table of contents in a Bible have done the biblical research to point out to me that the the tithe is never mentioned in the New Testament. It's not. Because that's not the standard of giving in the New Testament. Did you see it? Paul gave it to you. It's in the ninth verse. Remember Jesus, who was rich, but became poor for you, that through him, in him, by him, all of us might become rich. The standard of giving in the New Testament is the cross of Jesus Christ. You do not stand in front of the risen Savior who has scars in his hands, wounds in his feet, a wound in his side, and negotiate percentages. The standard is the cross. Now, I don't know where we let the word stewardship get so small. That somehow you can partition it off and make it only apply to your money. It's more than that. It's a lot more than that. You see, it comes from the concept that the people in, in Paul's day would have known. Uh, a, a, an owner, a, a landed uh, noble person would have had trusted slaves that did his work. And he would have a slave that was in charge of the household. He would have a slave that was in charge of the farm. He would have a a slave in charge of the business. And this trusted slave, the steward, was given the same authority as the master to carry out the work that they were charged with. And their only responsibility was to maximize the master's investment. That was it. Maximize the master's investment. In the same way, Paul calls us as stewards... Of what God has invested in us. We are stewards of us. And it includes all of us. Every aspect of our lives. Time. I have people come up to me and say, "Uh, well, Mike, I don't give money, but I give my time. Oh, really? How many hours are in a week? Do I have to do all the thinking? How many hours are in a week? 168. Divide that by 10. That leaves you with? 16.8. I'll give you an hour for coming to worship. Let's rub it off to an even 15 just to make the math easy. That's 15 hours a week that are focused on the service of the kingdom of God. Time, talent, resources, all the same. All the same. It includes All of you. Everything you are, everything you have, to be maximized for the glory, for the sake of the Master. God was up to something in the Roman Empire. And Paul wanted the Corinthians to be part of it. You have grown in every grace. He tells them, I want you now to grow in this one. It was a rite of passage. You know, I remember when I was called to preach. I grew up in a very devout home. You know my story. My dad taught a Sunday school class for 40 years. My mom played all the old hymns on the piano. And that was the background music of my life. There's never been a time when I did not know that Jesus was real. I've never had that existential crisis of belief where I doubted that God even existed. That's not part of me. 
Now, I've had crises of obedience. Plenty of times when I knew better but didn't do better. But never a crisis of belief. I remember when I knew that this was, this was what I would do with my life. And I, and I remembered why this was all I ever wanted to do with my life, was to tell people about Jesus. This is, is to try to help them have in their life what Jesus had done for them. What, what Jesus had done for me in, in their life. I don't remember when the budget became my job. I don't remember anybody ever telling me, you, you have to raise the budget. I remember being in some meetings where the people said, well, pastor, what are you going to do about the budget? I also remember kind of realizing, hey, if you don't get the budget, you don't get paid. So you get pretty good at it. Until you realize that the reason you have to get good at it is because far too many of us have responded to Jesus with yes, but. Yes, I'll follow you, but my career belongs to me. Yes, I will follow you, Jesus, but my time belongs to me. Yes, I will follow you, Jesus, but my money belongs to me. I've told you before about that word, but. It negates everything in front of it. You know that. You got the letter. I've really enjoyed dating you. But. To respond to Jesus with yes, but. Means no. To respond to Jesus with yes, but means no. Some of you have wondered where the Middle Tennessee Initiative came from. It came from most things. I began to see things that bothered me and I began to pray about those things bothering me. And all of a sudden, there seemed to be a way for us as a church to respond to it. What are those things that bothered me? I saw churches in the newspaper that were being offered for sale, church buildings. I saw news where a condo owner or a restaurant owner had bought an old church building and was going to change it to a restaurant or a condo. Now, get this, the church was going out of business because, quote, there was, they couldn't reach the people around them. But the condo owner, the restaurant owner, was buying it because they thought people would come to that building and spend money. See the irony? You begin to look around this great state of Tennessee that I've grown to deeply love. And you read stories about children dying in the care of DCS. That's not Somalia. It's not some third world country. This is Tennessee. You read about the devastation that drugs are doing in the rural areas of our state. You see how our schools are not serving our children well. And we're in danger now of children graduating with a degree who will be so far behind that they will literally never be able to check to catch up with the pace of our world. Tennessee has one of the highest poverty rates in the nation. 17% of the people in Davidson County live under the poverty line. Over 5% in Williamson County. Yes, there are hungry people in Williamson County. Access to health care. 
are some in the middle of Tennessee, with every hospital and all the great health care we have around here, there are people who cannot get in to the system. Middle Tennessee is lost. There are less Christians per capita now than ever in the history of Tennessee. We have lost the buckle of the Bible Belt. It happened on our watch. Most of your neighbors do not go to church at all. The children your children go to school with don't go to church at all. And that's right here. And the status quo commitment that we have had as Christians in Middle Tennessee won't cut it anymore. Status quo is what got it lost. Status quo won't get it back. God is up to something in Middle Tennessee. And this is your invitation to be part of it. It is a rite of passage. You have grown up. You know better than to think of God as some Santa Claus in the sky. That you pray for things you want and he'll come through. You know his heart is broken for the lostness of his people. Over the woundedness of his world. And as he cried to Isaiah, who will I send? When Jesus prays that the Lord of the harvest will send workers. You're now invited to join God in this great quest. It's a rite of passage where you should be able to be trusted with more. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just thinking about your own life. For some of you, it's just a matter of sitting still and making a list now of things that are wants that have too quickly become needs. Of thinking about your neighbors. Writing down their names, the ones that you know. Don't know Christ. There's no way in the world we'll be able to plant the churches that God opens for us. Start the new campuses, repurpose other churches without you giving significant time to it. Some of you are going to be the disciples there. Some of you will be the mentors, the relationships that we establish. Some of you may even be the pastors and the worship leaders. The status quo is not going to cut it anymore. So maybe it's a time to write down the things of your time. Now look at those obligations that you've committed to that don't pull you closer to Jesus. It's time to let them go. To create a capacity to serve. Or maybe 
Maybe here and this is the first time you have realized that you're not your own. Maybe you've known it. Maybe you've known something's not working. As hard as you try, you still, you still can't get it all to click. If you're trying to live your own life and if you're trusting yourself to, to take care of your own life, you're a train wreck waiting to happen. There are a lot of us here in this building who can tell you about what happened when we tried to run our own lives and the damage we did. Not only to ourselves, but to those we loved. It begins by understanding that what you've broken, you cannot fix. By understanding that Jesus Christ died for those sins, those mistakes, and his resurrection invites you to a new life by calling him Lord and Savior. That life is yours. A life beyond anything that you'd ever dreamed of. And it starts with that decision. I beg you. I beg you with all that I am, if you're here with that right now, do not leave until that decision is made. We'll be waiting for you back in the parlor. It's a comfortable room just across the, the atrium there. It gives us a chance to talk where we can hear each other and hear your questions. We can respond to them and pray with you so you'll know. Maybe it's as simple as becoming a member of this church family. However God is leading you now, He's waiting for you where you are. As the church waits for you as you come, Lord Jesus, don't let us hold anything back. Mindful of the time when the question came to you, you didn't hold anything back. Pray this in your name. The third chapter, the writer of Colossians wrote these great words that I leave you with. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's stand and sing these great words together. Holy, almighty Lord, saints and angels, Join with them and bow before Jesus, only Jesus. You will command the highest praise. Yours is the name above all names. You stand alone, I stand amazed. Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus.